welcome to I Was There. I'm Keith Quinn. Over this series, we're journeying through four decades of New Zealand history. We're featuring the best of the TVNZ archives, including some hidden gems and first-hand accounts from the key players, as well as those behind the scenes. All who can say, I was there. On this show, we pick up our look at the 80s from 1986. 1986 saw two big law changes in New Zealand society. The fight for values and standards is never over for me. Neither of which was entirely welcome initially. These are the ones who are the perverts, not the gay and lesbian community. However, by July 1986, most of the country was celebrating the passing of the Homosexual Law Reform Bill. It took a little longer for New Zealanders to get in behind GST. One lady said, well, the prices are going up, but so long as my tax is coming down, I'm happy. With the 10% tax on goods and services due in October, retailers were certainly enjoying a pre-tax boom. But the 1st of October 1986 was a much quieter day. Not a lot of money coming across the counter today. The tables were like that, and all the glasses were slowly sliding off. To this day, the Mikhail Lermontov lies where it sank in the Marlborough Sounds in 1986. The passengers were safely transferred to other ships in the area. A few months later, Queen Elizabeth was here, but she was not welcomed by all. For the Queen, the attack meant only a spattered coat. To Anne-Marie Thorby and Deborah Jane Leyland, it was a protest against the Treaty of Waitangi. In far deeper trouble and a world away, Lorraine Cohen and her son Aaron were sitting in a Singapore jail after being caught trafficking heroin. Lorraine Cohen had been found guilty of drug trafficking and sentenced to the only penalty open to a Malaysian judge, death by hanging. Both Lorraine and Aaron were eventually released after serving 11 years in prison. Back home, the country was horrified by the rape and murder of Teresa Cormack. The little six-year-old girl in a red raincoat was missing for eight days before her body was found in a shallow grave on Furunaki Beach. Somebody out there's got the key to it. Somebody knows who this person is. It would be 15 years before a scientific breakthrough brought her killer to justice. I said all along that they're going to be the dark horses in this competition. You know what I like looking at this crew is they look very calm. What did bring the country new hope was our foray into a brand new sport, for New Zealanders anyway. Behind the secure fence at the New Zealand docks, a huge operation is now underway. For the first time, we entered the America's Cup yacht race with a boat called KZ-7. Stars and Stripes seems to have closed down on New Zealand, but New Zealand does have the inside running. But 1987 was not our time. Not that you would have known it from the Heroes Parade our KZ-7 sailors received when they came home. Something else put a smile on our faces in 1987. What do you think you're doing, you mucky mongrel? The dog and Wal Futrot had been in our lives since 1975, but we'd never seen them like this before. I'll start training immediately. <coughs> Starting tomorrow. And not only did Murray Ball's much-loved characters get the star treatment... Dave Dobbin and the Herbs gave us a brand new anthem to go with it. After the break, it was a major step forward in human rights, but it was deeply controversial. We're with an early champion of gay rights in New Zealand. While the 60s and 70s were known for the rise of the protest movement and social change around the world, the 1980s actually saw some of the biggest changes here in New Zealand. There was the Springbok Tour protests of 1981, and around the same time a growing call to do something about the fact that it was still illegal to be homosexual in New Zealand, meaning many kept it a secret from their friends, family, and even from themselves. In order to live a life among my heterosexual friends, I must not 
make it known that I am in fact a homosexual. We find we have to sort of pretend and hide under a sort of facade of heterosexuality to get by. You're not doing anything wrong or yeah. harmful or anything. I mean, would you be ashamed of sort of loving another person? You know, you just might be ashamed of it. It's ridiculous. Gay men and lesbian had to hide. Um, not that you were going to be cut off to prison if you didn't, but you wouldn't get a decent job. There are twice as many gays in New Zealand as there are club rugby players. They are scattered right through our society. They are among the people you work alongside at your job. They are the ordinary people you see in the streets. They are everywhere. I was a married man. I was uh, teaching political science at Victoria University. Um, I had started to realise that I was gay and that um, marriage wasn't going to work in the long run. Um, and I was, yeah, really in a bit of a personal muddle at that stage in my life, yeah. What do we want? Gay rights! Gay rights! The gays are on the march. The 1981 anti-tour events were a big part of my life. Actually, a lot of the people involved in homosexual law reform had got some sort of training, I think, or some sort of sense that you can actually have an impact on the world. The last several years have seen a remarkable change to the face of the New Zealand gay community. Gays used to keep to the shadows. They are now moving to centre stage and declaring their homosexuality. Gay consciousness has been rising. And gays' newfound confidence means they are no longer prepared to accept prosecutions and heterosexual discrimination anymore. There was this generation of people who resisted hiding, but they were all very young, and among them I was probably the oldest, and one with this long-term interest in politics and some sort of uh, serious academic interest in politics. And so when the possibilities for homosexual law reform started to get going, I was often the one who said, look, you better do this, Bill. People are aware that if you're going to fight AIDS, you've got to fight discrimination against gays. That was actually how I came out. Um, not many people knew I was gay until that interview. Not the very close ones, but uh, a lot of people found out I was gay uh, on national television. A very efficient way to come out, actually. It stops a lot of unnecessary conversations. In every community, about 10% of the population are gay. That's a fact. It's the responsibility of the legislators to provide a climate in which society can deal with that fact. Probably about half the population thought that the law should go through right from the beginning, but there was a very, very vocal group who didn't. I think that a society that accepts a thing like that and tries to say that something that's abnormal is normal has really got something wrong with it and, and uh, that society needs help. The Coalition of Concerned Citizens says its big petition to stop the change in the law is a mandate for continuing its moral stand. There's going to be a crusade for the family unit and what is right and a bit of discipline in this society and I support that. Remember this is the time where AIDS is arriving and there's a huge fear of that, quite an irrational fear and the AIDS phobia and the homophobia were feeding one another. Is the AIDS scare a way of getting the law changed by a backdoor method? You failed the other way. Is this a different tack? Well, you know, the point is that if we're going to control AIDS, we're going to have to have a change in attitudes towards homosexuality. There was a nastiness about things, a certain amount of violence, uh, you know, um, things thrown at a house I had lived in where I was no longer living. Um, uh, someone I know bashed up, old man. That was the end of his life, really. He went into an old people's home. Uh, another young man bashed up coming out of a gay uh, venue. And, I mean, he survived, but uh, permanent neurological damage. About half of the gays in Wellington have from time to time experienced at least threats of violence 
in the past and there's quite clearly an increase at the moment. Actually, the campaign to change the law was creating a public um, kerfuffle which was intimidating to people and, and raising the suicide level and depression level and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, you're looking into Hades. They're looking at the homosexuals. Don't look too long. You might catch AIDS, all right? And it, it, it was a, a terrible situation to be in, to, to think that actually what we were doing to make things better was in the short term making things worse for people. God bless the normal people because it is the normal people of New Zealand that are going to tell these people we do not want homosexuality legalised. Norman Jones I met the first time in the Knox Hall in the heart when the fundamentalists and the campaign against the law reform had organised this big public meeting. You're down the drain. You're back into the sewers. You're back into the sewers where you come from. What they said really, really revolting things and a lot of our people got extremely angry. It looked like it was going to be a, an ugly scene which might not be good for anyone. And eventually Norman Jones said, look, you've got to shut up. We've bought this hall, we've, we've hired this hall. And if you want to speak, you've got to pay $175. I said, done. <laughs> If I have made the wrong decision so far as the voters are concerned, then I stand or fall by that. I thought about it long and hard, and at the end of the day, my conscience felt that I must do so. Vote for the bill at 16. Oh, I'm sure that I will lose votes, but um, then you might pick up some as well. I'm, I'm not here to vote according to what's going to win me votes or not. I have to do what I think is right. It scraped through. I mean, Trevor Mallard held up three fingers, I think. The bill legalising homosexual acts between consenting adults over 16 was passed last night by 49 votes to 44. When the vote was passed, my lover and I kissed uh, in the gallery and uh, you know, it seemed amazing to be able to do that when most of us had been hiding for generations. The atmosphere today in Auckland's Alexandra Tavern was more low-key compared to the jubilation last night, but for most gay patrons, the elation was still there after 18 months of campaigning. They'll all of a sudden feel a lot more easy, more self-confident, more relaxed about themselves because you know, they'll know that they're now 100% New Zealand citizens. They're not some uh, despised minority. They're entitled to their place in this country just the same as everyone else. All over the world there's been a softening of attitudes towards homosexuality and that's made it easier for a lot of people and it's good to have been a part of that and to continue to be a part of it. Join us after the break as we speak with one of the most beautiful women in the universe. In 1983, the most beautiful girl in the world was from New Zealand, Pakaranga, Auckland to be precise. At just 19 years old, Lorraine Downs was an unlikely winner against the usual bevy of professional beauties from South America. But those are just the kind of odds New Zealanders love. It was more than 20 years ago that famous sparkling tiara was placed on Lorraine Downs' head, whisking her into a life less ordinary. Live from the Christchurch Town Hall, Miss Universe, New Zealand. Tonight you'll meet 18 of the loveliest girls in the country. Hi, I enjoy exactly what I'm doing now, exercising, as I attend a gym regularly and I belong to a modern dance group. At that stage I was really loving my modelling and if you became a finalist, you received $500. And I thought, well, that will be my airfare to Sydney to pursue my modelling career. What sort of modelling do you most enjoy? Well, I love it all, but I would say my favourite would be fashion parade work because I love moving along the catwalk. And when you're wearing something that you really like, well, it's a wonderful feeling. Did you enjoy your work tonight? Yes, I have. I can remember it got down to the final three 
And they said, in the third place goes to such and such. And I thought, oh, that's not me. My, they didn't say my name. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm not going to place. You know, I'm not going to get anywhere. And of course, yeah, I, w- I won it. Congratulations, Lorraine. The lead up to the competition, again, Television New Zealand, they were in charge of organising my ball gown and my national costume. Hello everyone, I'm Lorraine Downs and I'm happy to wish you greetings from New Zealand. Tom Parkinson, he worked with me, he was brilliant. He said, you are going to have to walk down 12 flights of stairs in your swimsuit and in your evening gown without looking down. And so I would go into Television New Zealand in the weekends and he'd have me out in the exit, going up and down the stairs, practicing in high heel shoes. He also warned me about the Latin contestants and I'm forever grateful for that because I, you know, hopped on the plane with my four outfits to wear for a month which I had to rotate. He said, Lorraine, I'm going to tell you now, these Latin contestants, they will arrive and they will have an entourage. I don't want you to be in any way put off by that. And I'm really pleased that he did tell me that because I had my four little cocktail dresses when night after night these Latin girls came out looking amazing. We're meeting Miss South Africa, Leanne Husking. I was rooming with Miss South Africa. Her and I just became so close. But I can remember after the flight, I slept for like 14 hours. And I overheard her saying, yeah, she's um, she's very beautiful, but too short. 19-year-old Lorraine weighs 124 pounds and is 5 feet 8 and a half inches tall. We were there for a month and every day we would rehearse, but every night we were taken out to a different function. We would be out till midnight and then we would have to be up at six o'clock the next morning to prepare for rehearsals. And so that schedule was gruelling. I think that they do it on purpose because it sorts out the girls who are going to handle, if they do win, what's going to be the next thing that's going to happen to them. Miss USA, who was my runner-up, just before the judges' interview, um, we'd been all sitting around in a lunch break, and I just said, this has really been hard work. You know, I said, whoever wins Miss Universe, she's got a really hard year ahead of her. And of course, Julie pipes up and says to me, you know what, Lorraine, I think if you feel like that, you should really make sure you tell the judges that. Well, New Zealand is a beautiful country. It's a very natural green country, and if you like the easy outdoor life, then you like New Zealand. So I made the top 12, and I was thrilled with that. I was happy with that. And then they chose the final five, and I was just like, oh my gosh, I've made the final five. We would be very pleased to have any one of you five be Miss Universe of 1983. And I looked up sort of to the fifth tier and I found my mother and father. And that was a bit of a moment. And the announcement started in the fifth place and the fourth and the third. And then it was down to me and and Julie, who was Miss USA. The first runner up is Miss USA. Miss New Zealand is Miss Universe. It was like this assault of emotions, like, oh my God, he's just said Miss New Zealand has won. That, that's me. Oh my gosh, can I do this? Step out and show everyone how happy you are to be our new Miss Universe. And all of that's going through my head. And of course, then you have to walk up the stairs and sit in this chair. And then, all of a sudden, you see all of the girls come into you. And in that moment, I will say it was frightening because they absolutely mobbed me. They're coming up and they're kissing you and then they're wiping the lipstick off your face. And then it was just this whirlwind of media. And so I had been living in this hotel room with Miss South Africa. And at 4 a.m., I finally got back to the hotel room expecting to find my best mate there. And I opened the door and she'd gone. All of her things are gone. Oh my gosh, emotion. It's funny, isn't it? 30 years ago and it's there. And she had planted this big lipstick kiss on the mirror and said, you did it, love you. And in that moment I sat there and I thought, oh my gosh, this is like when I won Miss Universe New Zealand. Everyone's gone. And it was a really sort of isolating feeling. 
And I'm told that at six o'clock, I need to prepare to meet the media. And I was told to wear a dressing gown, to put my sash and crown on, and I would meet the media while having breakfast in bed. And then the doors were flung open and 60 media came in, and that was my first press conference. I didn't even have a dressing gown. I had to borrow my mother's dressing gown. I mean, it was, it was the beginning, and my life did change. To a lot of people, Miss Universe, it does look really glamorous, but it's, it's damn hard work. The Universe Corporation, it's a corporation. I have a job, I signed a contract, and so for 375 days I was contracted to them to work for them. So I would fly to a country and I would arrive, I would get off the plane wearing my sash and crown, bizarre, to greet the media, and then I would start working for the sponsor. Having to be on, on all the time, and like then going back to hotel room, getting ready for the dinner, arriving at the dinner, everybody wants to meet Miss Universe, and then on, on, on all the time. Even if inside you're feeling so tired and all you want to do is sleep, uh, that, there was that pressure. So I would do in-store promotions, as well as doing charity work, um, visiting hospitals, orphanages. These kids here, this is the cancer ward and it was times like that when I would have really realised how lucky I was and how lucky we all are. I saw the world in the year and it was the most incredible education I could have ever received. I grew up a hell of a lot and when you look at the photographs of me winning and then me finishing the year, it's two different women. I mean when you're put in a situation like that where you have to grow up very fast and have to cope with so much, you do become, I suppose, stronger. When I entered the competition, in the 80s, it was very much the thing to do. Everybody watched beauty pageants. And if you wanted to be a model, it was a pathway to, to go along. All of those girls were beautiful, but they choose a girl who's going to represent the Miss Universe. And for that, you're doing a job. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. You know, it's a fantasy. It is a fantasy because there's no such thing as the most beautiful girl in the world. It doesn't exist. Today, there's so many more pathways for young women to shine. So in a way, beauty competitions to me are, are outdated in the respect that there's so many other fields that women can shine. You know, and beauty isn't just necessarily a physical. It, beauty comes out in many different ways, and we now know that. Thank you for joining us for our look back at some special moments in our shared history. Join us again soon for another look at some fascinating archive and personal insights from those who can say, I was there. Mm -hmm.